There are some things in life that I don't get. Not many, because whether I agree with them or not, I kind of understand where most people are coming from, why they say and do the things that they do. But here's one I simply don't. And despite asking for logical explanations, I have received none. How come Israel was allowed to perform in the Eurovision Song Contest last night and Russia was not? Now, I'm not talking about uh, longitude and latitude. I'm not talking about points on the compass of the European Broadcasting Union's satellite. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about politics. How come Russia was banned from Eurovision, but Israel not just honored, but again winning a respectable place in the medal table? Can it be because Russia has invaded its neighbor's territory? Can it be because Russia has effectively annexed a part of its neighbor's territory? Can it be because Russia is making war on some of the people in its native next door territory? Can it be because Russia is breaking international law in so doing all of the above? Can it be because Russia is repressing human rights in the territory it now controls? Can it be any of these things? And of course, it cannot. Israel spent the entire week prior to the Eurovision Song Contest bombarding to smithereens an absolutely captive, illegally captive population of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. More than two million Palestinians live there. Israel controls every exit and every entrance. Most of the time, the people have no clean water and no electricity. A real problem in the winter, an even bigger problem in the summer, especially if you're trying to keep medicines usable in the midst of regular, repeated carnage. Israel spent last week systematically destroying people's houses. Of course, an Israeli bomb has zero impact on international public opinion, zero impact on the people who organize the Eurovision Song Contest. But of course, a Russian bomb is far more effective. Well, one or two of them have been particularly effective this very week. But returning to my point, Israel has illegally occupied the entire West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip for the last 65 years. 65 years of international law breaking. More than that, they have now illegally annexed the Golan Heights that belong to Syria and East Jerusalem that they conquered by military means. They have broken every international law by creating hundreds of thousands of settlers in settlements with separate settler roads, with an apartheid system where the Palestinians queue through the barbed wire to go from A to B while the settlers travel on a super highway built with your taxes. Israel has, by any standards, conducted an illegal apartheid system in the occupied territories for 65 years. Don't believe me. Believe brave Israeli journalists and broadcasters who've been making this very point this week. But not content with 65 years of law breaking, every so often, and last week was another, they go on a murderous rampage, killing women and children in their beds, in their houses, bombing an apartment building, 
to kill three of their political opponents, caring not that dozens, scores of other people were asleep in that very same apartment building. This is what I would call terrorism, wouldn't you? Even if you don't call it terrorism, it is a war crime that simply cannot be gainsaid. It is a war crime to target civilian residential dwellings. It is a war crime to deny electricity and water to territories that you control. It is a war crime to change the character of territory you have seized by military means and occupy. It is a war crime to annex and declare to be yours territory that belongs to another. None of these things are even contestable. But Israel is in the Eurovision Song Contest. It's in the European Football Championships. Even though it isn't even in Europe. Russia is in Europe. Now, whatever view you take, Russia has undoubtedly invaded Ukraine. Russia has undoubtedly, through referenda, separated some of the territory that it has liberated from its former owner, the state of Ukraine, and now it's in Russia. And that's why Russia's been banned. I actually don't have a problem with that. That is completely inevitable, completely predictable. It's what you would expect to happen. My point is, why does it happen to Russia, but doesn't happen to Israel? There's one other difference. Russia is on the receiving end of withering international criticism, ostracism, in the mainstream media. There is no insult considered too base to be thrown at Russia. But Israel isn't sanctioned or criticized at all. In fact, it's becoming a crime to criticize it in Western countries. Israel is receiving endless reward from the so-called international community for the crimes that it is Committing, I'm just asking why the double standard, though double standard doesn't quite deal with hypocrisy on that level. Now on to some other matters. The Pope had an audience with President Zelensky this week. At least that's what it looked like in the photographs. Zelensky was sat down while His Holiness the Pope was stood up. Zelensky was shaking hands with the chief of staff of the pontiff whilst remaining in his seat. Something you wouldn't do to a bum that approached you in the street. But that's how they treated the Pope. And I got to wondering what happened to the Pope. The Pope was very clear early in this conflict that NATO shared the blame for what has happened in Ukraine. Where did that go, Father Francis? Where did the peace plan of the Vatican go, Father Francis? Would you go to Moscow and stand up whilst Putin was sitting down? Would you bless the armed forces of Russia as you blessed the armed forces of Ukraine. Why do people who say they want to broker peace actually blow it out of the water by demonstrating vividly their preconceptions, their own personal and political dispositions? But more important than how Zelensky treated the Pope, it's how he's treating you that's worrying me. The economic, cultural, political position in Europe, American occupied Europe, it must now again be described, is such that one begins to question the sanity 
nor of the European political leaders. They will be richly rewarded for the stances that they are taking. But the sanity of you, the European public, who are watching silently, except in the case of France, and except in the case of thousands, not millions, of demonstrators against the war, against NATO, against the US, in various European cities, capitals, and otherwise. You are, for the most part, silently climbing on board a truck which you know or ought to know is taking you to the national political abattoir. We are spending billions defending the borders of Ukraine, but we cannot defend our own borders from thousands upon thousands, in the American case, hundreds of thousands, of illegal, overwhelmingly men, migrants who are arriving on our shores, undocumented, uncharted, unchecked, many of them disappearing to God knows where. Did you see the American border? Why is Joe Biden sending hundreds of billions of dollars to defend the border of Ukraine when his own border has literally fallen? It's literally fallen down and the masses of the oppressed of Latin America, oppressed by decades of US-sponsored dictatorship, the poor from Latin America, impoverished by decades of American economic and political dominance, are headed to a hotel near you. In Washington, they're turfing US military veterans out of hotels and putting the new influx of Latin American migrants in it. Is there any wonder that trouble is brewing in the US and in Europe over all of this, over the fact that we're endlessly a war abroad but can't even defend ourselves at home? And so I'm wondering, not just about Kamala Harris. Did you see the video of her talking about how her mother used to ask her if she thought she fell out of a coconut tree? Giggle, silence from the audience. I'm worried about the sanity of all and sundry in this political picture that we find ourselves in. India is on the warpath. And I'm right behind them. India wants its jewelry back. The British Empire stole trillions of dollars from India. And most of it is simply unrepayable. But the jewelry isn't. And India wants every last artifact and piece of precious jewelry that the British stole from them back. The most significant of which is the Kohinoor diamond, which sits, last time I looked, right on the front of King Charles III's regal, th regal uh, crown. Now, I'm ready, the Indians would like me to, to try and stage a citizen's arrest of His Majesty to return that stolen property to its rightful owner. Although it may be that the courts will get there before me. President Erdogan's downfall was eagerly anticipated and industriously worked for by the United States, by the NATO leadership, whose troublesome priest they are, he is. They have long wanted someone anyone, Boulin, or any of the uh, donkey derby opponents facing him in today's election to beat him, to get him out of office. Now, I have many, many differences with President Erdogan, but I'll tell you this, 
when I look at the people who hate him most, when I look at the people who are trying to bring him down, I say, well done, President Erdogan, because it looks like you are going to secure a first round victory, despite all the regime change efforts that were made. In Africa, we had the most extraordinary spectre this week, where the American ambassador to South Africa publicly accused the leadership of South Africa of breaking international law, of being criminals, the country to which he's accredited. He publicly accused them of being criminals. He's walked it back saying he realizes he crossed a line, but he did it. And it's there in the ether now for always. And I got to reminiscing. I was reminiscing about the role that the United States and the United Kingdom and almost all of the countries of the European Union, but not the ones that were then under Russian influence, played in the maintenance of and then in the destruction of the apartheid system in South Africa. I just saw a post which astounded me. In 1990, after the liberation, after the release of President Mandela, regarded globally as one of the greatest men ever to walk the earth, after his release and prior to his first ever visit, to the United States of America. The US government, which had him on their list of banned terrorists until 2008, wouldn't send him an airplane capable of taking him from South Africa to the United States. According to the post that I have just looked at, who do you think flew President Mandela to the United States for his first visit there after his release from the apartheid dungeons in South Africa. Donald Trump! Donald Trump sent one of the Trump Air Fleet to fly Mandela from South Africa to the United States because the United States government would not do so. I'm old enough to remember when all of the countries of Western Europe, of North America, and the United Kingdom itself stood four square with apartheid and against Mandela and the ANC and the freedom struggle. Yes, compute that if you're too young to remember it. Do you know who was on the side of the liberation movement all of those decades? Do you know who gave them everything they needed to liberate themselves? Russia. That's why the West is backing the apartheid state in the Eurovision Song Contest and banning the country that always struggled against apartheid. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. It is the mother of all talk shows.